Welcome to episode 50 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Myla the Butterfly. Today we learn how the love of a woman caused an unending battle in Hotur and Baldur. Hotur was but a lad when his father Hobred was slain, and him did King Givar take to his castle to be reared as his own son. Strong and nimble he became, and very comely to behold. He could perform mightier feats than any of his foster brothers. He could swim deftly and far like a seabird. He was a skilled archer, and he could box well with the gloves. Great gifts of mine had Hotor. He was a singer of songs and a sweet musician. With rare skill he fingered the harp and played the lute, and such power had he with stringed instruments that he could at will make his hearers merry or sad. He could fill their hearts with pleasure or stir them with strange terror. Pleasing indeed was this fair youth unto beauteous Nana, his foster sister, the daughter of Givar. Her heart was moved with love towards him, and no passionately did he love her also. De dear unto Nana, the fond embraces of Hotur. Now, there came a fateful day when Baldur, son of Odin, saw Nana while she bathed. The vision held him spellbound while he was consumed with burning love by reason of the splendor and beauty of her comely body. When she vanished, the day was made dim, and Baldur sighed full oft, as he thought with tenderness of the beautiful maid. But when he remembered his rival, he was moved to anger, for full well he knew that Hotor would be the chief obstacle between him and his heart's desire. In the end, he resolved to slay the young hero. Hotor soon came to know of Baldur's burning love and his fierce and bloody purpose. One day he went hunting alone in a deep wood. A deep mist drave over the land and enveloped the trees, so that he knew not whither he was wandering. In time he came to the dwelling of wood maidens, and they called him Hotor, and he marveled greatly thereat. When he asked them who they were, they told him that it was their lot to decide the issue of battle conflicts. Invisible, they fought in the fray, assisting those whom they favored, so that victory might be achieved. Hotor wondered to hear. Then they told him that Baldur had gazed with eyes of love upon Nana while she bathed, and was possessed with burning desire to have her as his bride. Hotor did they warn not to combat with his rival, because that he was a demigod whose body was charmed against wounds. But to Hotor they gave a sword-proof coat of mail, so that he might have protection like unto Baldur. They made a promise to aid him in battle. Then the maidens vanished, and their dwelling also vanished from before the eyes of the young hero, and he found himself standing alone upon a barren plain, where there was not tree nor any shelter whatsoever. The mist was driven before the wind. The youth thereafter returned quickly under King Givar, to whom he related what he had seen, and what had been told unto him concerning Baldur. He also made request that Nana should be his bride. Givar was willing indeed that his daughter should wed Hotur, but he said that he feared greatly the wrath of Baldur if he came seeking for Nana and were refused. No weapon, Givar said, can do hurt to Baldur, save a certain sword which is guarded in a cave by Miming, the wood satyr. A wondrous ring doth he also possess, which hath power to increase the wealth of him who owns it. But long and dangerous is the road which leads unto the satyr's lair. But long and dangerous is the road which leads unto the satyr's lair, the king added. It is wintry cold, indeed, and hardly to be endured. 
O'Toole, however, was resolved to win the sword with which to combat against Baldur, and Gibar counseled him to yoke reindeer to his cart so that he might be able to traverse the region of extreme and bitter cold with great swiftness. When thou dost reach the cave of Miming, Gibar said, and thou must set up thy tent so that its shadow may not fall upon the satyr, for if that should happen, he would remain within. Thou must needs wait until the satyr goes out, when the sword and the ring will await for thee. As Gibar advised, so did Hotor do. He went swiftly with his reindeer over the bleak wintry way until he came unto Miming's cave, where he pitched his tent. But long he waited ere the wood satyr came forth. Sad and dreary were the days, and restless and anxious the nights. Then, after wading through a night of long darkness, Miming came forth, and his shadow fell upon Hoter's tent. The youth sprang to his feet and struck down the satyr with his spear, and then bound him securely. Terrible were the threats of Hoter, who vowed that he would slay Miming if he gave him not the sword and the bracelet. The satyr held life more dearly than wealth, and gave Hoter the ransom which he demanded. In triumph did the young hero return unto the kingdom of Gibar, his fame was mooted abroad. Then Geldor, king of Saxony, came to know that Miming had been robbed, and he urged his war men to go against Hotur. So great was his desire to become possessed of the treasure. But Givar, who had magical powers, divined Geldor's purpose, and he counseled Hotur to meet him with his band, and received the shower of his javelins until there was none left and then to fall upon the bold invaders. So Hotor went to meet the men from Saxony. He awaited them on the seashore. Eager were Geldor's heroes to make onslaught, and fast and furious did they cast their spears and javelins, but Hotor had bid his trained warmen to resist the missiles with the shields interlocked and not to cast a weapon. When the men of Saxony saw that they were all more eager to attack, and soon they flung away all their spears and javelins, then Hotur's men began to hurdle the weapons against the enemy, driving them back in confusion, whereat Gelder, in great alarm, hoisted up on the mast of his ship a crimson shield to make known that he desired to surrender so that his life might be spared. But Hotur showed nor anger, nor vengeance against him. He approached the king with smiling face and offered his friendship. Thus became he the victor by reason of his kindliness as well as his might. A strong friend to Hotur was Helgi, king of Hologland, who loved Thora, daughter of Kusa, the ruler of the Finns and of the Biarmons. The monarch had a blemish of tongue, so that he stuttered greatly and was unable to utter with eloquence the sweet speeches of love. Indeed, he not only shrank from addressing strangers, but rarely spoke in his own household. He sent messengers under Kuza, pleading for his daughter's hand, but they were rejected with disdain, for the king said that the man who could not urge his own suit was unworthy of love's prize. Then did Helgi send the aid of Hotur, who could speak with fluency and charm, and promised him his lifelong service if he could win for him the heart of Thora. A great fleet did Hotur fit out, and he voyaged to Norway, fully resolved to take by reason of his strength the maid whose words could conquer not. To Kusa he spake first with eloquent tongue, and the king said that his daughter must first be heard, for he deemed it not right that he should prevail against her wishes or decide before her will was made known. So Thor was ushered in, and when she heard what Hotor said, she gave consent to be Helgi's queen. But when Hotor was thus engaged, 
Baldur invaded the kingdom of Givar with an armed band and demanded that he should have Nana for his bride. The king said he must needs make request of the maiden, and before her did Baldur plead his cause with choice speech and flattering address. But she said that a humble maiden could not be wooed by one of divine birth, and that the pledges of the gods were often broken. Thus did the maiden reject the love of him who sought her. When Hotor returned to Givar, told him what had happened, and the young hero was filled with wrath because of Baldur's presumption. With Helgi he took counsel, and together they debated how they could inflict punishment upon the god. They had no recourse save to battle blows, and Hotor fitted out his fleet and went against his rival. Helgi gave him strong aid, as did also Gelvar. Then broke out a war in which the gods fought against mortals. When Baldur fought Odin and Thor clad in full armor, and when the imposing fleets met at a sea, a great conflict was waged. Hotor in sword-proof mail attacked the gods with fury. Now Thor was swinging his great club, and while he urged those about him to press forward, he called upon his foemen to attack. The black-browned god dealt furious blows. He struck down his enemy's shields, he broke through their ranks, for long none could withstand him. Terrible indeed was the slaughter, and to the gods it seemed that victory was being given. But Hotor went against Thor with Miming's sword. He feared him not and struck at the great club, which he severed in twain with his keen-edged sword. Then the gods took flight before Hultur, and the ships that remained were destroyed by the victors. Hultur rejoiced in his triumph, but he sorrowed greatly because that Gelder had been slain. A great pyre he caused to be built with the wreckage of Baldur's warships and the corpses of the oarsmen were placed there in a heap. Then, above these were laid with reverence the body of the dead king. Torches were applied, and the flames rose high and bright. The ashes of King Gelvar were afterwards laid in a great mound. The ashes of King Gelder were afterwards laid in a great mound, which was erected to his memory, and there was much mourning for him. Then did Hotor return to Givar, and Nana and he were wed with a great ceremony, while the people rejoiced. The Helgi and Thora, who were also united in their joy, did the young hero give gifts of treasures. Then Hotor ruled over Zealand and Sweden. And here is where I end my tale for today, but I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.